Okay, five, let's kick off. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Daily Energy Markets Forum. Every day, Gulf Intelligence takes a quick review of where the markets are opening in Asia. Uh, and there's no doubt that all arrows are green this morning. Let's start off in Sydney. Peter McGuire, CEO of XM Australia. Uh, as stated, Peter, um, finally, the Biden COVID bill was passed last night. Uh, all equity markets hitting more records by the day. And now oil, after a few days of uh, downward trend, seems to be now pointing upward. So all green arrows. Well, good morning, Sean, and good morning, panel, and everyone, and welcome from Sydney. Uh, that's right. I mean, you know, that Dow was bid up around about 1.5%. We've got that US dollar, Sean, that's back at that 91.8 off those highs earlier in the week. And Asia equities, Australia was a flat line today, but across the board, the majority were well up, some up nearly 2.5%, and still a couple of hours to trade. Some were a little bit down as well, but it's a mixed bag. But when you're saying that as far as the commodities, yeah, crude, it's been all over the shop. It's been a trader's delight. And that Brent has been just, you know, volatile. And that's what traders want. So from where we sit, it presents wonderful opportunities. And that whipsawing is not a bad place to be. I mean, from a week ago, Peter, it feels like we're back where we were, although a lot's happened in those seven days. Yes, exactly right, Sean. I feel as though some of that, um, look, we understand Biden and, and getting that through. A lot of it was baked in, but there could be further uplift over the next couple of days as far as US sentiment and general, uh, you know, those good numbers that came out last Friday, of course, were non-farm payrolls that, uh, that really shot the lights out at 380,000 versus consensus at about 200,000. So that momentum, we're coming into April or mid-March, mid April, Easter, just around the corner and hopefully a little bit better weather and, uh, you know, COVID we put behind us. Peter, we had, uh, as noted uh, the, by Carol there, data on the OECD in, uh, upgrading its forecast for the year. But we also had the, the Chinese come out uh, over the last few days and give us their sort of target number, if you want, 6% growth for um 2021, uh, that was seen as modest. What's your own sense for the outlook for China growth over the year ahead and its impact for oil demand and oil prices? Well, first off, Sean, I think the oil demand will be fairly strong. So, I, I um, and the rebound, possibly that 6% is just a line in the sand and, you know, under promise and over deliver the old mantra, you've come out of a COVID year. So, uh, you know, if you shoot seven and a quarter, uh, well, we, we performed better than what we thought. So I think that there's the first part. The second part is if prices stay at these sort of levels, then that's going to be a very strong global demand and very strong global economy. Uh, certainly from the producer standpoint, some of the consumption side from you know the consumer is going to be, I think, fairly, fairly tough coming out of that COVID year. It's going to be, I think, quite hard over, across the majority of Asia and certainly into India. So whilst we look at those numbers, also take on board those numbers that, uh, China, that India are, are forecasting, it's going to be a very, very solid 21 and certainly into 22. If we don't get a rerun as far as any further COVID, uh, it should be a good year, year and a half for all the commodity sector and, of course, growth. Peter, meanwhile, back in your neck of the woods, we had a pretty strong statement overnight uh, regarding the situation with Taiwan and the US, the, the top uh, US military officer in the Asia Pacific, uh, Admiral Philip Davidson, telling Congress that uh, China could invade Taiwan within the next six years and the Chinese sort of screaming back that he was being hyperbolic. Uh, how sensitive is that issue, do you think? It sounds, in, obviously under Trump, it became quite elevated. Should we expect that tension to remain elevated around Taiwan? Before I answer that one, yeah. a couple of hours ago, we had the Japanese Prime Minister come out and say that they are standing by our side in the sense of the, the, uh, uh, the, the team of four in Asia, which US, Japan, Australia and New Zealand. So... They've got our, um, 
our back and we hopefully have their back. So that's that's very, very, very strong words to come out of Japan. So anything specifically on, triggering that the, uh, the the coal issue or what? No, no, very much along Biden's um, Biden coming out. And I believe that they're talking in the next matter of days as far as that team of four or that quad okay. group. So there's the first part. So Japan is very conscious of our involvement through that whole Asia basin, Asia Pacific, more importantly. So, yes, it's they're an ongoing issue, Taiwan and China. We all understand that six years. There's talk that General Michael Flynn's brother might be taking over that role in um, uh, on the west coast of America, as far as the Pacific. He'll be the uh, the acting general. So um, it'll be hard to see. Hopefully, how am I going to put this? Hopefully, we don't see anything raise its head as far as China and, and Taiwan, but it certainly is. It's a it's a sleeping sleeping dog there. And if you kick it hard enough, I'm sure that things will probably escalate in the years to come. And as they're saying, well, I, I think if, if, if you look at that other part of that narrative that we saw surface recently in the US, where uh, I think it was General Motors had to close down one of its assembly lines because they couldn't get a sufficient number of microchips in order to as uh, assemble their cars. And Taiwan produces more than 50% of the world's That's microchips. Right. I mean, that yes. is in of itself a sort of a national security issue uh, as you think about uh, all of the pieces in which microchips go into. Uh, Taiwan is an absolutely critical asset on both sides. And I think that only becomes heightened and hence may be one of the reasons why we're seeing tensions rise there. And there are many others. Uh, the res least resistance for oil prices in Q2 is higher. Uh, there's a big number in this room that don't think that's true. Peter, your thoughts on that, the direction of travel after this wobble of the last week, we went up above 70, we came back down again. We're having a little bit of a bounce this morning is this a trend line or are we going to be stuck in the mid 60s well i think we're going to be stuck in the mid 60s sean i want to see where that us dollar trades over the next matter of weeks leading up to easter if it stays above that 91 and a half and you know that between 91 and a half say 92 and a half then i feel crude prices will probably be unless we see something dramatic from a geopolitical there's there's no I don't see any global problems like 21. So we're coming out of that. So I think crude will stay around that, you know, that 64 to 68 trading range. Um, after Easter could be a different bag altogether as we go into that Northern Hemisphere summer, the demand picks up, uh, Biden becomes further, uh, in, I think, embracing that president to presidential position that he holds. He's been very quiet over the last matter of weeks. So I think that crudes are, I don't think a lot of smart money's on it at the moment. It's whipsawing and there's no really directional trade, Sean.